the guards have problems because um, they, um, they weren't readers. I mean, they hardly read a book in their lives. One fellow said to me, he said, I've never read a book in my life, no intention of reading one. No, I said, why do you want one? I, I couldn't convince him that I needed books. However, one kindly man, you often get a kindly person looking after you when you're a hostage. You know, there are some psychopaths, there are some who couldn't care less, there are some who are quite humane. This humane fellow said, I'll try and get you a book, but he had two problems. He couldn't read English, and he couldn't be seen going into a bookshop to buy English books, not in the Middle East. I mean, if he'd been seen buying English books, it would have been a trail to the, capt uh, to the captives. So he had to work through a series of cutouts. Anyway, one day he came in and I put my blindfold, I was my blindfold on, he came into the room, he said, I've got a book for you. And he dropped it on the floor. I said, oh, thank you very much. When he went out, I took my blindfold off and I laughed out loud. Unknown to him, unknown to himself, he brought me uh, Great Escapes by Eric Williams, which was <laughs> stories of escapes from prison camp in World War II. He didn't know that. It was useless. I mean, I, I know what he was like, chained up like this, you see. <laughs> and, and there I'm reading about these fellas escaping with a wooden horse, you know, but, and uh, you know, digging out tunnels and so on. And then he went away and he, he, he brought back um, another couple of books. He brought back, uh, um, oh yeah, a manual of breastfeeding. Can you imagine it? A manual of breastfeeding. It wasn't even illustrated. You know, I thought, oh, crumbs. I, <laughs> I, thought, I said to him, you can't bring me this. He said, that's all we've got. He said, you read. And the next week he brought me, um, from the, he brought me Dr. Spock, Baby and Child Care. And then I realised, of course, he got, on, he got stuck on the wrong shelf in the bookshop. Shelf, in the bookshop. So I said, well, I have to find a way of getting him off that shelf onto something else. And so... I said, can you bring me a pencil and paper? Because for the whole of the years, I never had anything to write with. Wasn't allowed to write anything. So he said, OK. So he went away, brought me a pencil and paper. And from beneath my blindfold, I drew on a bit of paper the picture of a penguin. And I said, if you see that on the front of a book, buy it, it'd be a good book. And that little, little thing worked, little trick worked. Next week, he brought me a penguin book. And thereafter, I got a good string of books, and uh, they were a lifeline to me. What did it really feel like that you were likely to die in a few seconds? Well, I'd been through at that point uh, a fairly long period of interrogation, and I was feeling pretty, uh, pretty exhausted. And then I was chained up, lying on the floor, and the chief uh, interrogator came in, and he said, uh, you have five hours to live. He said, if you have anything to tell us, you tell us. Otherwise, you have five hours to live. So I said, I have nothing to say. So he said, all right, and he went out. And at that point, I was so exhausted, I lay down and I went to sleep. You know, the body's natural reaction took over and I just went to sleep. Then I heard the door open again and I must have been asleep for the whole time, five hours. And he came in, he said, anything to say? I said, no. He said, right. I said, well, I have a couple of things to say. I said, I want to write a letter. In fact, I want to write two or three letters to my wife, my family, my friends, and the archbishop, who was my boss. He said, you can write one letter. So I wrote a composite letter, and I remember it very well. I said, um, I want you to know that I'm dying in good spirits. I don't want you to be too hard against the people who've killed me. They have suffered a lot in their lives. And uh, I'm just sorry that I go like this. Words to that effect. He then said, uh, do you want a drink? Whiskey, brandy, gin. And I said, I'll have a cup of tea, <laughs> being English. <laughs> and a Yorkshire. <laughs> Cheshire man, actually. Cheshire so man. He, brought me a, he brought me a cup of tea. It was very nice, too. But I felt scared. Of course I felt scared. Then he said, right, um, stand up. I said, I'd like to say a prayer. I said, the Lord's Prayer. So you can say a prayer. I was blindfolded, of course. Mm -hmm. Then he said, face the wall. 
So I turned around and faced the wall, what I imagined was the wall, turned round anyway. And he put the gun there. And then he dropped it. And he said, another time. Well, at that moment, I mean, I felt this. Yes, very afraid. I thought it was for real. And it could easily have been for real, because a number of hostages died. I thought, well, I'm terribly sad to go like this, particularly as my family will never know how I've died. Nobody will know, apart from the group here. And yet, on the other hand, death is really something of an adventure. I thought, well, perhaps, you know, tomorrow, after this, I shall now know what it was, uh, what I've never known, you know, what the next life is like. And in a sense, it's an adventure. Although I certainly didn't want to die, although I was very afraid, there was also the belief that it was not the end of everything. You know, that my own religious belief came into operation there mm -hmm. and that there was hope beyond death itself. But I couldn't say I found it easy. I mean, there's a lot of hooey talked about religion, a lot of nonsense talked about it. And people say, oh, well, you know, you should be protected and it should, if you've got true faith and true belief, it should help you this way and help you that way. I've, I got a Bible and I read it and honestly it made me feel worse when I read the Old Testament. I'll tell you why it made me feel worse. Because I was sitting in the room at the time, chained up, and outside they were knocking the daylights out of each other. There was a battle going on. And in fact, I remember one time they chained me up and put me in the bath because I was, I was in the line of fire in the front room. So they put me in the back, back room. I don't know, it wasn't much safer, but they put me in the bath with chains around my hands and a blindfold on. And I remember a bomb or a missile landing on the next building, next door. And I could hear the screams of people and the ambulances and everything. And part of the ceiling fell in and there was I chained up in the bath, you know. It was <laughs> the hottest bath I've had for a long time, you know. And I even thought to myself, oh, blimey, you know, this is, this is something. So we were facing all that sort of, all that sort of, uh, of, of real nonsense. And then you, you come out, and back to the question of, of religion. I believe, you see, religion, if it's real true religion, should make you face the truth. The truth about yourself, the truth about human nature. If you do that, it's painful. It's very difficult. It's not necessarily going to be easy. I mean, I tried to examine the truth about myself, and I found that I was a mixture. There were parts of me that were okay, there were parts of me that were pretty not, not very good, not very nice, sometimes deceptive, you know, just human. But if you're going to face up to that, what religion, I think, enables you to do is gradually harmonize so that you're not overwhelmed by the dark side of your nature. It helps you in that respect, as far as I can see. And also, more than anything else, it enables you to maintain hope. I mean, I could say, quite genuinely, in the face of my captors, and I mean, I've been through it. I've had a mock execution. I've been beaten on the feet with, on the soles of the feet with cable and so on, you know. I mean, I've had the rough treatment. And I could say to myself, though, in the face of my captors, you can have the power to break my body. You have the power to bend my mind. But there's a part of me, my soul, is not yours to take. And no matter what happened, no matter whether I died in captivity or whatever, um, there was a part of me that wouldn't be taken. And that gave me hope. But, as I say, going back to the Bible, mm. when I saw them knocking daylights out of each other in the Bible, as well as outside, and I said, my gosh, what's changed? And yet, you see, the Bible, if it does one thing, Look to the Bible for false comfort. Don't look to it hoping you're going to find a sudden flash of inspiration. Some might. One in how many? What it does, it just tells the truth about human nature and also the truth about God, eventually. And sometimes, as I've already said, truth isn't necessarily comfortable.